we've had this nice discussion about all the problems of capitalism and now the question is, well, actually, is there something we can realistically do about it? And if, we, if there is, what is it and how do we achieve it? And it would be quite easy to kind of go back and just look in the history books and just, you know, repeat the sort of lessons of the past. And I am going to come back to that later in the talk, but I wanted to, as much as possible, just, you know, look at today's world and like look at it from as, as much as possible, not an ideological perspective, but just let's look at the practical reality around us and what do we practically do in relation to that. And I wanted to uh, start, therefore, with um, something which is happening in Britain. I mean, British politics at the moment is all, um, uh, it's all been for years now being focused on Brexit. We've now got Boris Johnson in and, you know, the whole scandal at the moment about, um, you know, having the break in Parliament and all this kind of stuff. And um, there's several things you could say about that. But I want to go back just about two weeks ago. Um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who's the leader of the opposition and has kind of created a, you know, a, a made his mark in Labour by basically you know, putting forward a much more left-wing um, platform and basically essentially, you know, yeah, campaigning on a on a on a you know for a socialist change, and uh, Corbyn basically said, wrote a letter to all the politicians and said, "Look, if you put me in as British Prime Minister just for a few weeks, uh, I'll you know we'll we'll cancel this idea about a No Deal Brexit, and then we'll, we'll then we'll call new elections, and then all of the like you think about all of the mainstream moderate forces in British politics, so and especially." The Liberal Democrats, there's a bunch of you know, right-wing Labour MPs that are split off um, and you know, the sort of so-called moderate Tories. That all of them are saying Brexit is the worst thing that could possibly happen um, to Britain. We've got to stop Brexit at all costs. Jeremy Corbyn is, you know, is a failure because he's not fighting Brexit enough. Brexit is the worst thing at all costs. And then uh, Jeremy Corbyn says, OK, here's a plan, a realistic, achievable plan uh, to end Brexit. And what did all of those moderate centrist forces say? No way. <laughs> And then, so I mean, the, the conclusion from that is, the rulers don't want socialism no matter what. Even if this is the worst crisis, you know, Brexit is the worst thing that, from their point of view that could happen in, in Britain. Um, it doesn't matter how bad it is. Oh my God, Jeremy Corbyn, even worse, right? But, I mean, the point is, like, you know, at all costs, they don't want socialism, even if it's in a moderate form, even if it's, you know, through the respectable parliamentary channels, it doesn't matter what the, what the story is. So that's conclusion number one, right? That's in terms of the elite and what they want. Now, the second conclusion is more from our point of view, right? And it sort of seems a bit um, frightening, but nevertheless, I mean, like, you know, I'll, I'll come back to this. It's actually, there is, a, there is a hopeful conclusion from it. But the starting point is, there is no one coming to save us. <laughs> You know, if, if we're going to save ourselves, it's going to be us saving ourselves. It's not, it's not some saviour from on high is going to come and deliver. And I want to give just one example. This graph is a graph of cumulative worldwide carbon dioxide emissions. So right on the very end is like 1750 right up to um, 2017. And so you see, even like up to 1850, even like 1900, there'd been a noticeable increase, but it was still very tiny compared to, compared to what we've got now um, and that line that i've drawn in the middle which is in 1992 now i could have gone back a couple, a couple of years back 1988 uh, was the year that james hansen um, presented the evidence in before u.s congress to basically show that climate change was real and by 2014 um, global worldwide emissions of co2 had more than doubled um, between 1998 and, and 2014 and even from 1992, I mean, those figures only go up to 2017, it's not quite doubling, but 1992 was the year of the Earth Summit, the Rio Earth Summit. So that was, at the time, it was the largest ever gathering of heads of state that had ever happened in the world. Uh, it was a big scandal about, you know, is George Bush Sr. who was in the White House, is George Bush Sr. going to turn up or not, and all this sort of controversies. And, and we on the left were basically, you know, essentially saying it was a bit of hot air. But if you, if you judge it on its own terms, so don't, so ignore the criticisms of the critics, but if you judge it on its own terms, that Earth Summit basically said climate change is real. Um, that was the one that started the UN uh, Convention on Climate Change, out of which we had the Kyoto Protocol, out of which we had the Paris Agreement, all those sort of things came out of there. In 1992 they said, 1990 is going to be the baseline year. We're going to measure our emission reductions from 1990 levels onwards. So if, if that Earth Summit had been, if, if the countries of the world had done what they said they were going to do, we would have left that Earth Summit and, uh, and emissions would have gone down from 1990 levels. But instead, since then, 
it's not only gone up, it's more than doubled. <laughs> All right, that's, that's the thing. So, so you know, in terms of, you know, so this is, what I mean, this is what I mean I say is, for capitalism, there is no bottom line. Like, they want to make money, doesn't matter what. That is the only criteria. Must make profits. And it's not even the case that, like, oh, well, you know, it took us a bit of a while to get used to the idea, but now, you know, countries are sort of, um, you know, now we're sort of getting onto it and everyone talks about their emission reductions and, and you know, their Paris targets and whatever else. But, you know, you just have to think about this. Last month, July 2019, was the hottest month on record. The hottest month on record ever. Now this month, August 2019, we've got people deliberately lighting fires in the Amazon. <laughs> and we've got the government of Brazil encouraging it and promoting it. And we've got the government of the United States, the most powerful government in the world, actively supporting and promoting it. And, you know, and in general, capitalist governments around the world are sort of doing nothing about it. Now, you know, that is, that's not like 25 years ago. That's right now today. Right now today, this is what, this is what, um, uh, this is capitalism, full steam ahead, you know, burnt, cook the planet, carbon pollution is non-stop. <laughs> and if, if you, um, I, I guess to sort of underline this even more, uh, this was a Green Left article from May, and it, um, it uh, you know, echoed, it. I mean, lots of media covered, it wasn't like some weird Green Left thing. Um, but this is a Green Left article from May this year, reporting on an international monetary fund report that governments around the world have got subsidies to fossil fuel industries totaling more than $5.2 trillion. A new report by the International Monetary Fund reveals that global fossil fuel subsidies grew to $5.2 trillion, 6.5% of combined global GDP. The report found the annual energy subsidies in Australia totaled $29 billion. So here that is governments of the world giving free money to the fossil fuel corporations, pollute the planet more, even though 25 years ago, we said, you know, this is a serious problem, we need to do something about it. And right now, this year, trillions, trillions of dollars, free money to corporations, please pollute the, money, the, the, the planet more. So this is what I mean when I say, there is no one coming to save us. The only way we get out of this mess is if people step onto the stage of history themselves and actually take power out of the hands of um, the corporate elite and their governments, their bought and paid for politicians. So the conclusion is we need our own power. We can't rely on capitalist power structures or capitalist power systems anymore. We need to have our own power. We need a democratic people's power. We need a democratic um, you know, people's um, uh, process. And you know, in other words, the, what that means is we need a revolution. Because a revolution, a revolution at its most basic level, what that means is it's a change in the way that power is structured and organised in society. So, from you know, in, in terms of in terms of us solving our problem, that's the first thing we need to recognise. Our goal is we need a change in that power structure. We need a um, uh, we need to have we need to have revolution. Now, um, okay, we look at today's world because you know we can go back. It's easy to sort of look back and. Um, at the, the Russian Revolution of 1917, now over 100 years ago. Um, and uh, I 100% would you know, advocate that people study that. There's a lot of useful things to learn from that experience and a lot of lessons that we can, we can draw, and I'm going to come back to that. But I think also the truth of the matter is that if you, if you ask people to, in today's world what is the face of socialism, they're less likely to say Vladimir Lenin and they're more likely to say um, someone like Bernie Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn or whatever else. And I think that's actually, you know, I think we need to devise a strategy for social change starting from the realities of today's world um, and, and, and not like just treating um, political theory as if it's like some Bible we just read in the history book and then, you know, everything comes from that. Um, and, I, and I think especially you know, I mean, there has been a big change in, um, in, the, uh, in the world in the, you know, compared to 100 years ago, whereas now we, people are so much used to parliamentary democracy, capitalist democracy, in a way that wasn't the case 100 years ago. Uh, and you think about, like, you know, even 
um, even up until World War II. I mean, the, women didn't win the right to vote in France till 1944. And in World War II, you had, you know, half of Europe was um, taken over by sort of fascist dictatorship. It, you know, there was no democracy. Parliamentary democracy was very fragile. And even a, a few decades before that, most countries in Europe didn't have universal suffrage. Whereas now, universal suffrage, even though, I mean, our democratic rights are being curtailed and infringed uh, uh, quite uh, seriously, um, nevertheless, I think there is a certain expectation in people's minds that you know, there's a certain legitimacy in the minds of ordinary people in the parliamentary system, despite the fact that the parliamentary system is the system that is giving us that, you know, $5.2 trillion, $5 trillion uh, you know, subsidies to the, um, to, the, uh, you know, to, the, to the fossil fuel industries. And, and I would argue very strongly the case that despite the, the surface, the apparent features of democracy, the parliamentary democracies that we face are actually fundamentally undemocratic. They're fundamentally organisations that reflect the will of big business. To me, I think that actually the most accurate way to describe, say, the parliamentary system in Australia is that it is a corporate dictatorship disguised by democratic forms. The substance of the matter is that there are two major parties, both of whom take turns in forming government, and those two major parties are both bought and paid for by the big corporations. They both represent corporate will in slightly different ways, but nevertheless, that's the policies that they, they represent. You can't rise to the top of um, either party without being you know, a slave to the corporate interests, um, even if they might not necessarily agree in every respect on every policy, but, um, but nevertheless, they both represent corporate interests and, it's, and they use democratic forms to disguise what is essentially a corporate dictatorship. Okay. Now, so moving along, I do want to, as I said, I want to come back to, well, what are the lessons of the past that we can, that still hold relevance for us today? And I guess I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, but I think this is what I think is the summary in terms of if we're looking for, if we're looking for a strategy for how we can change society. So the first one, um, the goal has got to be an anti-capitalist goal. I mean, like if we're, if we're not, um, if we're not aiming at, restructuring, transforming this society so that it's A, not exploitative, not oppressive, and also B, that it can be democratic and people control it, um, you know, we're, we're going to go off the tracks. So the goal has got to be anti-capitalism in one way to express it. Socialism, I guess, is the more positive way to express it. Especially, I think, a lot of people sort of have got this... A lot of young people... A lot of this, the idea of anti-capitalism is a lot more popular today. Uh, than it has been in the past. But a, a lot of people have got very confused ideas about what that means. Like, oh yeah, anti-capitalism, that means shopping at the organic market. It doesn't mean shopping at Coles, you know? Um, and I think that, you know, there's more to anti-capitalism than that. Um, second point is that uh, we need revolution, which I said, as we, which as I said before, is a, is a change in the, in the power structure. And you only have to ask yourself the question, is there, ever, anywhere in history, in any country, any part of the world, any, part, any time in history, where a ruling power has given up power voluntarily? And the answer is no. <laughs> so what we need is, we need to find the way to actually uh, take that power out of their hands and, and you know, use, that, use that to build a new, um, a new power. Now the third point, mass action. It's like, the source of their power is, you know, it, when it comes down to it is the fact that they own wealth, they own money, and they've got the power structures that sort of are kept in place by that money. Um, but that is a source of their power. Now, we don't essentially have <laughs> the money. The uh, Oxfam's, you know, shrinking number of uh, billionaires in the world that own half the same wealth as half the world's population. Um, we don't have access to that kind of wealth. What we do have is the power of numbers. And therefore, you know, any strategy for change which is going to be successful from our point of view is you know, going to leverage our source, of that, of our source of power. And our source of power is, is, is the mass action. Now, now that might sort of seem sort of quite obvious, but what that, the conclusion of that therefore means is we're not fundamentally going to Parliament and saying, please, nice Parliament, do it for us. We're not sort of saying, let's sign petitions and lobby um, 
uh, lobby the, you know, their current rulers to, to do it for us. There's lots of different ways of, and also it, it also means we're not gonna smash windows or sit in the streets and just by the power of shock value, um, shock you know, the ruling class into sort of, into giving up power, because none of those things have worked in the past and there's no reason to think that that has changed today. What we are talking about is building up the source of our own strength, the source of a, you know, a people power, that's the fourth point, people power, um, as, the, as the alternative to the current capitalist power structure and, it, and our method of, um, uh, of winning change is, is about you know, mobilising at the grassroots. Now I'm going to come back to that um, more, um, but um, the next point, you know, the struggle for reforms. Uh, it's in general, I think, you know, you'd say that the the lessons that we have learned, this, you know, the socialist movement has learned over, you know, over the last 150 or more years, has basically been there's sort of two kinds of mistakes you can make. So one kind of mistake you can make is to sort of um, is to uh, drift into what you know, they call a reformist perspective, which is the kind of please miss the nice capitalists, be nice to us and give us these reforms. Um, basically limiting yourselves to what, what the ruling class is prepared to offer. That's one mistake, isn't it? Or, or even, even if you do it not in a sort of a timid way like that, but in a basically just limiting yourself to, um, to trying to make incremental improvements in the system you know, as it exists, that strategy hasn't worked. Um, on the other hand, if you just stand on the sidelines and say, revolution now, we need socialism, that sort of, that sort of standing on the sidelines also doesn't work. <laughs> so for us in Socialist Alliance, we want, we're, we're looking for a socialist strategy. And I guess I, I meant to say in the beginning, like I'm not trying to <laughs> uh, present this talk as if, you know, I, I'm expressing the fond of all wisdom. It's actually, this is a discussion that we all need to have. And I think that, as I said, in today's world, there isn't an example of a, of a successful socialist change in an advanced capitalist country. We, we are all of us in the process of figuring it out. So this is just you know, some of the guidelines and parameters and, and the starting point for the discussion about how we change it. But anyway, in terms of, in socialist lines, what we view is the strategy is, it needs to involve that struggle for reforms. We need to be involved, obviously with the, with the mass action, like with the involving people, like not just lobbying and asking politely, but actually drawing people into um, struggles for improvement, exactly like, for example, happened with the marriage equality campaign, which lasted over 10 years, but people would come out again and again and again. And of course, there are lots of different elements to that campaign, but one of the really important elements was that the protest movement just never stopped. It just kept on coming back again and again and again, and mobilizing that power of you know mass numbers. At the beginning, um, the Labor Party and even even some of the queer bureaucracies were against. Oh, don't don't ask about this marriage equality. It's too much to even ask for. Uh, just limit limit yourselves to civil unions. And Labor at the time was promising to sort of um, to change laws with that involved discrimination, which they did when Kevin Rudd got into power. But the protest movement, right from the very beginning, despite opposition, said, "No, we want full equality. We want marriage equality." Um, and that protest movement just kept on coming back again and again and again until it won. I think that's. Um, that's one example among many that we could, uh, we could talk of. So the idea is, and the struggle for reforms, we need to support every, we need to be involved in the struggle for reforms and improvements, but link that to a broader strategy of social change, which is a more fundamental, transformative, or revolutionary approach. And then the final point that I'd make in this sort of section about lessons from the past uh, is uh, what I put in inverted commas, leadership. Um, as I said before, I mean, for, for us, the, 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 the motor force of social change is what's happening at the grassroots, is that rank and file, the mass involvement. But the truth of the matter is, the reality of the matter is, rank and file will can only be expressed when it is organised, and organisation requires leadership. And, and I think, you know, from that point of view, it's like it is, it is impossible to imagine that um, we're just going to have protest movements and sort of spontaneous struggles and just by accident, uh, we're going to just find ourselves in a revolutionary situation where we've, where we've you know, transformed society and, and capitalists sort of had centuries of actual experience <laughs> um, buying off and diverting attention and you know, maintaining their rule in all sorts of different ways. 
They've, they have literally had centuries, centuries of experience of dividing and conquering um, and maintaining their rule. Um, it's not going to happen by accident. And therefore, we need to organise, not only in trade unions and social movements for improvements and reforms, we actually need to organise today, even though we turn out to be a, you know, a, a small crowd, we need to organise for that fundamental social change, for that revolutionary change. And therefore, for us, that's, that's a... I mean, that's, you know, a lot of the other stuff is actually easy for a lot of people to agree with. But, I mean, for us, that is the sort of... That is, that is the strategic nub of the question. If you actually want to make change, you need to organise for it, and that means building a revolutionary socialist organisation today. Um, uh, uh, yep. Now, I don't have a nice um, picture of um, Bernie Sanders, but if I had thought about it, I'd have a nice sort of, you know, <laughs> um, you know, Bernie Sanders picture come up now. Because I think, as I said before, it's not enough to just repeat the old formulas by rote. We need to actually work out a strategy for, you know, how we can, um, you know, how we can change things from here. And I think that it's, it's hard to imagine in today's world that's not going to involve some element of participation in the parliamentary process because that's what most people look to as the, the source of authority um, in, in power, in society. And um, that doesn't in any way change the perspective which is one of revolutionary change, but it, it is actually, and, and actually going back to the Bolsheviks and the Russian Revolution 100 years ago, they said the same perspective, the same thing as well. Uh, Lenin mocked some ultra-left um, critics in, uh, in Germany who said, oh, parliament is now historically and politically obsolete. <laughs> and, and Lenin said, oh, you know, politically obsolete? Oh, there's still millions and millions of, um, uh, of, of workers are still supporting these old conservative um, organisations and the, in Parliament and you, you, can't, you can't say that it's politically obsolete until the workers from their own experience, not because someone told them at a book, but from, the, from their own experience, they realise that the parliamentary system is an undemocratic system and we need to build not a backwards undemocratic system, we need to go forwards to a more uh, democratic system. Anyway, I, I want to quote now um, and this is sort of getting close to the end of my, uh, what I want to say, from a quite an interesting discussion paper by a guy called um, Tyler Zimmer. I don't really know very much about him, um, but he's from the, the, um, the, the Democratic Socialists of America. In fact, let me go back a sec, because I, I said before, I, I, you know, it'd be nice to have a, a picture of Bernie Sanders up here. Um, when I say that, there's something quite exciting happening in the United States and, and, um, and, uh, and Britain in particular, and in some other places as well, um, where socialism is becoming, getting a, you know, a, a popular awareness and, um, and support that you know, is new, and especially in the United States where even just the idea of healthcare for all was some, you know, well, even Obamacare, like, you know, the sort of the miserably pathetic, you know, Republican um, healthcare plan. Now that, that was, I mean, Obama just did a, adopted a Republican healthcare plan. Uh, that was considered socialism by the sort of Fox News and the sort of Republican right, you know. Um, so, uh, so there is something interesting and dramatic happening in, um, in, uh, uh, in the United States and, and other places as well. But it's important that we don't look at it just as the individual Bernie Sanders or the individual Jeremy Corbyn or the individual Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for a few reasons. I mean, one is that they're not perfect and, and there's any number of criticisms you can make. And I did an interview on Green Left TV, which is worth having a look with a US socialist called Paul LeBlanc. And he put forward, I think, a, a very uh, sensible argument that we should, socialists should be supporting Bernie Sanders and other people who run on the Democratic ballot line. Uh, supporting all their strengths, not being afraid to criticise their mistakes, but linking that to this um, this this process of uh, creating a grassroots socialist um, organising organising pro process. So I think the important thing for us is it's not about the individuals; it's about the the popular reaction and the building up of a popular grassroots, um, you know, the mass action popular power. Uh, as part of that strategy for, um, for change. Now, so this guy Tyler Zimmer from the Democratic Socialists of America, uh, he's uh, got a paper which is called, is a, is a Revolutionary Rupture with Capitalism Possible? 
And he's um, part of the Democratic Socialists of America. He's very much got this idea about we want to, you know, elect a Bernie Sanders government and, and all this sort of stuff. And he sort of says, and, and he, this is an answer to uh, someone who's basically made an argument that all that can be hoped for in today's world is, is you know, reforms through Parliament. And he says, well, still, the question remains, how do we get from capitalism to something qualitatively different? No one is in a position to decisively answer this question for certain now. And, um, and I think that's true. I think, I think all of us, as I said before, all of us are part of a discussion about, um, about you know, uh, how we're going to achieve social change in today's world. But he says, this much is clear. We have to find ways to take advantage of every opportunity to increase working class confidence and organisation, no matter how small or partial it may be. Revolutionaries must be deeply involved in day-to-day -day struggles for reforms because they make the lives of workers better now, but also because they teach workers how to fight. So for those two reasons, we need to be involved in, you know, in struggles for reforms. And he says, we've actually got to win some of these reforms now. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I actually think in today's world, given that, given that UN report about 12 years to save the planet, and now down to 11, I think we actually need to be talking about making revolution for real in the next 10 years. But either way, whether we, whether we do or don't, either way, we need to have some serious emission reductions and we need to have some, you know, some, you know, improvements in other respects as well. We've actually got to win some of these reforms in the here and now in order to convince people that it's worth it to engage in collective action and challenge the bosses. The case for solidaristic strategies for change can only be won by example. What's more, we need to succeed in decommodifying basic social goods in order to prove that alternatives to the market are feasible and worth fighting for. So in a United States context especially, decommodifying basic social goods, an example of that would be healthcare. Like at the moment, if the only way you can get to the doctor is with private health insurance or spending your own money, that's commodified healthcare. Um, whereas, not quite Australia, but say the, you know, the British National Health Service or some of the other health services in Europe, where you just walk into the hospital, you walk, walk into the doctor, you don't have to pay a cent, uh, that's a decommodified health um, health system, and he's right. I mean, when people see the example of even even examples like Medicare, which aren't perfect by a long way, they still actually make it easier to, to get a sense of, oh, yeah, well, we could have a we could have a society which would run on human need. You know, Medicare is a is a partial step towards that. Okay, but then he goes on to say. Um, Another ingredient is needed also. <laughs> Layers of workers who can act in independently in a coordinated fashion to win the masses to the idea that going beyond capitalism is possible and worth fighting for. This layer cannot be a small sect or party outside the class. Um, it must be a collection of respected working class fighters who spent a long time winning trust by engaging in the struggle against capital. Now I should say, I mean, this guy has got an idea of like a Bernie Sanders style government that comes to power, in, but then there's some run, uh, rupture. And then it's either got to go backwards to sort of you know, neoliberalism or else forwards to, um, to socialist change or more fundamental change. And uh, so then he goes on to say, um, the, those, these fighters must be prepared for and expect that social democracy will reach a crossroads wherein the choice will be to maintain capitalism at all costs or else to maintain pro-worker reforms by going beyond capitalism. This crossroads will arise because capitalism inevitably produces crises that, as we've seen, undercut the capitalist profits and serve as the material basis for delivering social democratic reforms. Um, those unwilling to go beyond capitalism will then be obliged to impose austerity, break strikes, discipline rebellion, and do whatever it takes to re-establish favourable conditions for capitalist profit making. I'm finishing up. If nobody prepares for this crossroads, it is highly unlikely that any revolutionary transformation can be achieved. So I think that we need to be open to new forms of organisation. And um, uh, but critically, we have to continue arguing for the case for socialist change and being involved in um, social struggles along the way. I think this is probably the slide that I wish I'd had before. Um, you know, so, the, so just to go through this quickly, first of all, this is the, this is the face of what a lot of people see, but the, the reality is there's actually more than just the individual. And this is just a small chapter of um, democratic socialists, but they've gone from a, 
a tiny moribund organization of very old people to now a very young and dynamic um, organization of, of 60,000. Now, I don't have time to sort of talk about it in detail, but this is, a, this is a picture from Venezuela. And I think Venezuela shows a similar kind of example where a government was elected uh, that actually had a genuine interest in uh, looking after the welfare of the, of the mass of people and introduced a whole series of reforms that capitalists didn't like and they fought back against it. And then the response of the government was to organize and mobilize the people um, to actually uh, defend those reforms and defend the government against attack. And I think my, my opinion is that the stage, that's an unfinished struggle in Venezuela. Um, and so it only sort of shows us part way, it only shows us part of the example, but nevertheless, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an important example to look at of, you know, of, of this sort of process unfolding in today's world. And finally, just to the, the final picture I wanted to come back to is the, uh, the a picture from Rojava, which Kamala mentioned in her talk, but this is another um, very contemporary example that's happening right now today in northern Syria, where there is a grassroots democratic process of you know, political transformation taking place. Again, it's incomplete and it's only in part of the country. And there's, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily uh, immediately you know, applicable, but there's also one, one thing it's inspiring to just look at, just to see that example. And two, um, no doubt there are things that we can, uh, we can learn from that as well. And then just very quickly, finally, the thing I'm going to finish on, um, whatever else we're going to say about socialist strategy, one thing is also 100% clear is that any strategy for social change in today's world is going to involve, is going to be intertwined with the connection to um, avert the climate crisis. That's it. Thank you.